Hi, everyone, and welcome to Xylazine 101, a training for first responders. My name is Zoe Grover, and I'm the Executive Director of the Police Assisted Addiction and Recovery Initiative, PARI for short. I'm joined today by Liz Langang, PARI's Program Manager for this project. I'm also joined by Dr. Mary Jo Larson and Becca Olson of Brandeis University and Tracy Estevis Camacho of Thomas Jefferson University. Dr. Larson is a senior scientist within the Institute of Behavioral Health at Heller School at Brandeis University. She conducts health services research on harm reduction programs and pain management services. Becca Olson is a project manager on this project and also works on the Massachusetts Drug Supply Data Stream, which monitors the illicit drug supply in Massachusetts. And Tracy Estevis Camacho is a clinical research coordinator at Thomas Jefferson University, working with Megan Reed in harm reduction research. This project essentially has three stages. The first stage was focus groups conducted by Thomas Jefferson University. The second stage is a webinar series on xylazine for law enforcement, which you're at today. And the third stage is working with 10 communities to design a community intervention. Next slide. Today's objectives are to identify the effects of xylazine, to understand the change considerations for an overdose if someone has xylazine in their system, and to begin to think about next steps to develop and activate a community response. Next slide. Grant funding for R2X is from the 2022 Combating Overdose Through Community Level Intervention Coakley Initiative, a project operated by the University of Baltimore Center for Drug Policy and Prevention. Coakley Initiative funds are provided by the Office of National Drug Control Policy and the Centers for Disease Control. So what is xylazine? Xylazine is a sedative used in veterinary medicine and is not approved for human use. Xylazine is not an opioid, unlike fentanyl and heroin. Xylazine has been found primarily mixed, though, with fentanyl or other polydrugs, but also with heroin and stimulants such as cocaine and methamphetamine. Xylazine amplifies an opioid's effects, therefore individuals are at heightened risk of overdose. Street names include Trank, Trank Dope, Sleep Cut, Philly Dope, and Anesthesia de Caballo. That's a Puerto Rican name. Now I'll pass it off to Dr. Larson to give an overview of the overdose landscape. Hi, everybody. So you're probably aware that despite all the initiatives we've made, overdose deaths are still increasing. This slide shows the increase over time through through 2021 in drug-involved overdose deaths. And at that, in 2021, we reached 106,699 deaths, a higher rate in um, males than females. Next slide. But we do see a lot of variation in where deaths are occurring. Um, some states have much higher overdose death rates. Overall, the death rate is 32.4 per 100,000 individuals in the United States, but there are some states shown in these darker colors where the rate is much higher. In West Virginia, it's over 90 per 100,000. In the District of Columbia, in Louisiana, Tennessee, Kentucky, the rates are exceptionally high. We think this is because of the spread of fentanyl involved in drugs from the East Coast towards the West Coast. So fentanyl is much more deadly in the drug supply. So variation is what we're emphasizing. Next slide. Um, we don't have good estimates of the contribution of xylazine to these deaths or even to what extent xylazine is in different communities. Um, our, the official data collected by the CDC does not currently capture xylazine in fatal overdose deaths. 
in some communities, uh, there is a comprehensive, a more comprehensive count because of, uh, of the postmortem toxicology being done in certain jurisdictions, but it typically has not been tested in the mortality data. Also, there's no typical screening uh, for xylazine in medical settings, such as emergency departments. Um, it's detectable in urine for a short period of time, so that's not feasible. If emergency departments or medical settings want to do that detection, they must take the blood sample and send it to another lab. For um, So it's not useful for clinical purposes at this time. So right, the main message is many communities are unaware that xylazine is already in their drug supply. While test strips to detect xylazine and drug samples are newly commercially available, their accuracy remains uncertain. So we're not sure to what extent if that's an effective intervention. And users of xylazine typically report that we know that it's colorless and odorless, so it's difficult for them to pick, on, pick up on any visible cues that a substance contains um, xylazine. Now I'm going to pass it to Becca Olson. Thanks, Mary Jo. Um, so as you can see on the slide, um, across the folks and probably experience in your communities, um, across the country, folks are seeing that drug-related morbidity and mortality are high, um, just generally, from um, folks using different substances, and xylazine may be contributing to those increased numbers. Across the nation, xylazine presence in opioid overdose deaths has been rising, um, and xylazine has been identified in the drug supply across the nation, as you can see in the two images on the left, um, and in even more states than are pictured here, including Florida, Rhode Island, and more. Um, xylazine is an emerging issue in many places, and we would love to hear from you all um, if you have experienced it, so feel free to put that in the chat. Um, next slide. So to zoom in a little bit more on the issue, um, Philadelphia has been hit pretty hard by xylazine over the past few years. Um, in 2021, 90% of the street opioid samples in Philadelphia contain xylazine. Um, and in Massachusetts, we have been seeing xylazine since 2020. Um, it's increased um, its presence since 2020. And in 2022 was found in over one third of the opioid samples. So it's not being found alone, but it's being found with um, fentanyl or another opioid. Next slide. Um, so how is the data on the last slide collected? Um, through community-based drug checking, uh, the Massachusetts Drug Supply Data Stream project that Zoe mentioned that I work on is an example of community-based drug checking, which is a helpful strategy to monitor the illicit drug supply and inform people about what's happening um, in the local supply. Many sites use a Fourier transform infrared spectrometer, which is a chemical instrument that can test um, powder or other kinds of samples in real time. And then the samples are sent off to labs to get even more information. Uh, MADS is a program that provides reports and data based on lab sampling in Massachusetts, but you all should investigate and ask around um, to see who is testing for xylazine in your community and ask them to share their data with you. Next slide. So this is a brief example of what community drug checking can look like. This is what it looks like in Massachusetts um, for the MADS program. Uh, that little cash register-ish looking device, that's the FTIR, Fourier Transform Infrared Spectrometer that I mentioned. Um, and then next to it, fentanyl test strips, which I'm sure that many of you are familiar with. That's an example of on the ground community drug checking that anyone can do. Um, and then below that is a gas chromatography mass spectrometer that does the more advanced testing that can tell us a little bit more about what's happening in the supply. Um, most programs do report out what they find to local communities and partners. In Massachusetts, we work with a variety of different organizations and police departments, um, and this may be happening in your state. So make sure you ask um, and request updates from the folks who are doing that work. Next slide, please. Um, so we are currently aware community drug checking in the states listed here but if there is drug checking happening in your state or community, please let us know. We would love to hear from you um, and learn from you. Um, and then the labs 
that have the gas chromatography mass spectrometer. Those are listed on the second bullet here. Um, Drugs Data shares their information publicly as well as um, the University of North Carolina. But you can see a little bit some summaries that CFSRA posts. Um, they have a, they've done a lot of work in Philadelphia. So um, this may be a good place to start to see where xylazine is found in your region or just across the nation and in what combinations. Now I'm going to pass it over to Liz. All right. Thanks, Becca. Um, so right now we have a video to share with you about xylazine symptoms and effects. In this video is Jason Bienert, a wound care nurse in Maryland. He has more than 10 years of experience in critical care nursing, nursing leadership, and wound, critical wound care. Um, over the past three years, he has treated hundreds of xylazine wounds, and he led the development and implementation of a wound care program in Maryland called Voices of Hope. A few months ago, a PARI employee went down to Elkton, Maryland to meet Jason and make this video. Um, the sort of epicenter of this crisis in the US is in Philadelphia and Elkton, Maryland is about an hour from Philadelphia. The presence of xylazine in this community has been slightly lower than that of Philadelphia and as a result, Jason has been able to figure out exactly how to address xylazine in this community um, and with a little bit more time. So this is the video that he made for us. Xylazine is a drug that's being added to opioids to extend the high. The effects of it are um, extreme sedation. Typically when used in conjunction with fentanyl, um, most users report sleeping for two to three hours afterwards and deep sedation occurs where um, the person's completely unarousable, even through sternal rubs, pinching, any noxious stimuli doesn't wake them up. Chronic use of xylazine has been shown to cause uh, some withdrawal symptoms. Xylazine withdrawal symptoms can be extreme uh, changes in blood pressure, up to and including hypertensive crisis that requires uh, critical care to fix, um, extreme anxiety, hallucinations, and uh, that's in conjunction with the opioid withdrawal. Um, so these are above and beyond normal withdrawal symptoms. Xylazine's also been known to cause wounds that can progress into very large ulcers and ultimately could lead to amputations if not treated quickly. Signs of an overdose with opioids and xylazine on board, uh, decreased respiratory rate, blue uh, fingers and nails, dusky appearance, um, cold, unarousable, to the point of sternal rubs don't wake them up anymore, pinching them doesn't wake them up anymore. If there was an overdose with the opioid and xylazine, arousing after naloxone administration is very difficult. Uh, people don't wake up from these kind of overdoses. They just return to normal breathing. All right, so we do want to thank Jason for that video. And just because this video is so important, um, I do want to review it a bit so that everyone has a very solid foundation of understanding about um, what it means when individuals are exposed to xylazine. Um, so, so some signs and symptoms um, include unconsciousness and profound sedation. Um, and often this is felt about one to two minutes after consumption and the peak drug effect occurs about 30 minutes after and can last for several several hours. Um, the thing that is important about this unconsciousness is that this heightens a person's risk of injury, robbery, and assault because they are unarousable, and it often complicates the opioid overdose protocols. Um, other signs and symptoms include respiratory depression, hypothermia, low blood pressure, and low heart rate. 
Um, next slide, please. Um, so many of you have probably heard about acute skin ulcers. Um, they have been pretty widely covered in the media. These are painful necrotic flesh wounds and due to the pain, individuals may inject directly into the wounds for relief. And this increases the risk of infection. Um, it can cause abscesses. It can worsen already severe wounds and decrease wound healing. What is sort of unique about um, xylazine is that wounds can be found in places beyond the injection, injection site. So if an individual injects somewhere on their body, it doesn't always mean that a wound will appear there. Um, when these wounds become too severe, they can lead to amputation, which is why the fast advancing ulcers need medical evaluation and treatment as soon as possible. Um, the key to solving these ulcers is early detection and wound care management um, for the early stage wounds. Um, what's also important that we found after speaking with um, many people across the country is that having wounds can, can impact a person's ability to enter into treatment. Um, even if they're ready for maybe a detox service, they're denied because of these wounds. Um, so this is another area that we have to learn to manage. And for advanced stage wounds, hospitalization and antibiotics may be necessary. Next slide, please. Um, so now we'll jump into the health effects of xylazine. Um, individuals can become dependent on xylazine and um, as a result undergo withdrawal. These withdrawal symptoms can include severe anxiety, agitation, and high blood pressure. Um, they also may experience disorientation and hallucinations. And I do also want to note that there is no known antidote to reverse a xylazine overdose in humans. Um, there is an antidote to reverse xylazine overdose in animals, um, but is not safe for humans. Um, I think that's something that's currently being researched, but as of this point, we don't have anything to reverse a xylazine overdose. Um, and now I will pass it off to Tracy. Thanks, Liz. Hi, everyone. Um, so it's helpful to hear what people who use xylazine have to say about it in their own words. Dr. Megan Reed and I are based in Philadelphia, where it's estimated that 90% of drug samples sold as dope have xylazine present. Um, we've conducted focus groups and individual interviews with people who use drugs in Philadelphia to hear about their concerns over xylazine. Um, there is some existing literature that has found that people like using xylazine, but we haven't really heard that um, when we talk to people here, and we mostly hear that people don't like it for a number of reasons. Um, first, uh, the wounds that are associated with xylazine use. Almost everyone who um, we talk to in a focus group or individual interview who was using xylazine um, had xylazine-related wounds, um, including some people that did not inject drugs. Um, here we have two quotes about it from focus group participants. Um, the first one says it's not meant for human consumption. I mean, it says it right there on the bottle and there's no way to prevent it. I got wounds in places I don't get high in. And another person said, sometimes when you shoot xylazine, even if you don't miss, you have black all over you or like some scab. Next slide. Um, people also talk a lot about the sedation that comes with xylazine use. Um, these are two quotes from interviews. The names that we have here are pseudonyms. Um, so first, Michael talks about uh, the blackouts that he experienced. I'm having more problems with the trank than I am with the fentanyl down here. I have basically blackouts from the trank. I lose days at a time, like I'll lose four, five, six hours. And then Shook talks about being unconscious for long periods of time and the impact on his body. Uh, you know, I don't like falling asleep and waking up and having no idea how I ended up on the floor or why my arm is sore from, you know, being in an awkward position or why I have cuts and bruises and I don't know how I got them. Next slide. Um, people also talked about being interested in xylazine test strips. Um, so here, Judah says, I don't know if anyone has mentioned this, but the dope that they've been putting out here has tranquilizer in it too. That's why it's killing a lot of people. I don't know if there's a way for them to make tranquilizer test strips too, but that would be useful to us in particular because 
uh, if they could make them too. So this interview is um, from 2021, um, and there was a lot of xylazine present uh, in Philadelphia, but it wasn't as saturated as the current um, dope supply is. Um, in focus groups, people in Philly, people would say that xylazine strips now are not really helpful anymore because they're physically dependent on xylazine and they're currently seeking it to avoid withdrawal. Um, but they did say that it could be useful in areas where it's emerging as an adulterant because it can prevent getting exposed in the first place. Um, and then here's a quote from Nicole who talks about how terrible the withdrawal is. Uh, she said, because it's like one of the worst detoxes right now because the rehabs can't seem to find something to help with the withdrawal and the tranquilizer is the worst habit to kick because apparently it takes two to four weeks to get off of it. Next slide. Um, I'm going to hand it back over to Zoe to talk about uh, overdose response. Yeah, thank you. Um, and actually, we can just go to the next slide. So as we've said a few times on this webinar, xylazine is almost always found cut with fentanyl. So we wanted to make sure that we addressed a couple myths associated with fentanyl exposure before we get into the overdose response. So the first myth is that touching fentanyl and its analogs could cause drowsiness, illness, or even overdose. And the fact here is that fentanyl actually does not absorb well through the skin and incidental skin exposure is highly unlikely to cause an overdose. So if you are exposed to fentanyl on your skin, use soap and water to remove the fentanyl. Uh, myth number two is uh, harmful doses of fentanyl are often found in the air and lead to overdose. And again, the fact here is that fentanyl and its analogs are actually unlikely to be in the air as powdered opioid and so are not readily dispersed. Next slide. Okay, and so we're going to play another video. This one, again, is Jason Biennert, uh, the nurse from Elkland, Maryland, and it's about the recommended response to an opioid overdose with xylazine. Recommended response to an opioid overdose with xylazine is to administer Narcan, um, just like any other time. You tilt the head back, administer the full dose, um, check for breathing, and you would re-administer naloxone every two to three minutes from that point. Over-administration of naloxone can lead to precipitated withdrawal. If administering naloxone does not bring them back to normal breathing, rescue breathing is important. Continue to administer rescue breathing until uh, emergency personnel can arrive and take over, or two to three minutes is up and you can administer another dose of naloxone. At this point, if their breathing is returning to normal or has returned to normal, you want to um, put them in the recovery position. In these situations, you need to stay with the participant. Um, that's why we, we instruct everybody to call 911. Our organization in, in this county has actually, um, the police have dropped folks off that they're concerned about, and we've been able to sit with them for um, upwards of four and a half, five hours while they recovered. Um, my recommendation is reach out to your local harm reduction organization or community organization um, and, and kind of establish those ties. So we're just gonna quickly review Jason's suggestions. So again, step number one is always to administer Narcan or naloxone, even though naloxone does not reverse the effects of xylazine, it is likely that fentanyl is also present and there is a strong chance that an opioid overdose is taking place. Step two, uh, follow the naloxone instructions, just literally what's on the package. Administer one dose intranasally every two minutes, uh, two to three minutes and continue this process until breathing is restored to about 10 breaths per minute or one every six seconds. Uh, next slide. And, and then as Jason said, uh, provide rescue, be rescue breaths until EMS arrives. I know a lot of the folks on this call are going to be the first ones to arrive and, and maybe EMS workers themselves. Um, and I also know that a lot of our police partners use valve masks to provide rescue breath breaths and either works. And again, just continue that pattern of Narcan then rescue breathing on a two minute cycle until normal, normal breathing returns. There are complications from profound sedation. 
for first responders, it's my understanding that um, your protocols likely prevent you from leaving an individual who you are unable to rouse, even if breathing has returned to normal. So there would likely be a transport to the hospital. But for others watching, we want to note that extreme sedation caused by xylazine makes the sedated individual at higher risk for other harms, such as assault and robbery. So if you're not transporting the person to a hospital, you want to make sure that they're being monitored. And so the takeaway is for those of you who will not be transporting an individual to the ER, try to think of local locations that will be a safe place for heavily sedated individuals, like a harm reduction clinic, like Jason was talking about. Next slide. Again, back to um, Jason's advice, once breathing is restored, um, just a reminder that once breathing is restored, you wanna make sure that the person is in the recovery position. You can see the diagram on the right side of the slide keep the person's airways open and keep checking their pulse and breathing and provide supportive management until the drug wears off. And now I'm gonna pass it off to Liz. Thanks Zoe. Um, now we'll talk just a little bit about messaging and activating um, so what your community can do. Next slide, please. Um, we do wanna take some time to address stigma. Stigma ends up being a very important thing for people who use drugs and language really does matter. People with substance use disorders are less likely to seek treatment due to stigma. Um, stigma causes people to have lower self-esteem, feel isolated, um, they may fear being judged, and they may hide their drug use. Also due to stigma, we do know that individuals with substance use disorder often receive poor and inadequate medical treatment. And all of these things lead to uh, um, increased risk of overdose and they decrease the likelihood that someone will enter into long-term recovery. Um, so just for some practical examples, we want to use um, first-person language rather than using a stigmatizing word like addict. We could switch that out for person who uses drugs or person with substance use disorder. Um, for, more, for most medical conditions, you are not the medical condition excel, itself. Um, for example, if you have cancer, you are not cancer or cancerous. You are a person with cancer. Um, we also want to use judgment-free language. So rather than saying someone has a problem, we might say that they are struggling with addiction. Um, and rather than saying um, clean, we would want to use the phrase in recovery. Obviously, when you say that something is clean, it is implied that it was dirty before. Um, and that is very stigmatizing language, um, which can lead to that low self-esteem and judgment. And then uh, finally, we want to use neutral and medically accurate terminology. So instead of saying zombie drug, which implies many different things, um, xylazine is the medical terminology for this drug. Um, and instead of using a phrase, phrase like flesh eating wounds, we can say necrotic and severe wounds. Um, again, we just don't want to promote stigma that leads to the inadequate treatment or that leads to individuals not even seeking treatment in the first place. Next slide. Um, so this is going to be a video of Sarah Laurel. She's the founder and executive director of Savage Sisters. Um, she founded this organization after she overcame homelessness and entered into recovery herself. Um, Savage Sisters has nine houses. They offer weekly street-based outreach. Um, they have a drop-in center. They offer harm reduction training. Um, and they're just doing a lot of great work for the community in Philadelphia. Um, and in this video, Sarah's gonna talk about the experiences that she's had dealing with um, xylosine in her area. because of xylazine. There's been a multitude of changes within our community. The appearance of individuals that use substances is a bit different. Uh, the reversal method when experiencing an overdose is different. 10 years ago, you hit somebody with Norcan, they wake right up. Um, now they are not responsive. They're tranquilized. They're sedated heavily. Um, so we've had to update uh, overdose reversal methods. We've also seen a 
huge increase in the amount of open wounds and infections um, within the community of individuals using substances. Specifically the way that it manifests physically in people who use the substance, it, it's not pretty. It is hard to look at. And unfortunately, several individuals have begun to say really stigmatizing things about this drug, and especially my community and the people that we serve. We're not zombies. We kill zombies in America. We don't save them. We're human beings. My name is Sarah. I have friends. They all have names. They have moms that are falling to their knees every night hoping that they get better. These are very painful wounds and they're so afraid of the stigma that they'll be met with in the medical world. They, they would rather stay out here. Create a safe space when you're talking to one of my friends. Believe what they say. Let them speak. Having that conversation with them and talking to them about how to advocate for themselves in the medical system is important. Letting them know when you speak to the clinician, tell them, I, I am on xylazine and this is what I am experiencing. Um, we printed business cards that say, test me for xylazine. The most difficult thing about this work is that we're not collecting the data and my friends are rotting to death on the street. They're dying in a first world country from a body infection because they would rather die on the street than be mistreated by doctors and nurses who think they don't deserve proper care and they're not worth saving. So that needs to be changing all across the board. What we need is more shelters, more low barrier housing, more access to showers and toilets, clean clothing, and clinicians street side. If you can't get that, do what you can. Go out with a street-based you know, wound care team and do street side wound care. Our housing program is filled with individuals that are coming off of Trank. It's hard and it's painful, but they're making it, you know. They're, you can get through it if you find the right location that will treat you with compassion and help you get through that physical detox. It, it helps a lot. It's a, it's a really big hurdle, but we've seen people do it um, and we keep doing the work. Great, so um, we do wanna thank Sarah Laurel for making that video with us. Um, and now that we've heard a little bit about her experience, um, we'll jump into what to do and what messages you can deliver to your community. Um, we do wanna alert people who use drugs of the presence of xylazine in the drug supply. Fake pills can look like real pills, but they actually contain fentanyl and xylazine. Um, as we mentioned, Oftentimes people don't know that xylazine is in the drug supply and they can be really caught off guard and not prepared for that. Um, we also want to encourage early treatment of wounds and medical treatment for severe wounds. Um, we will be sharing a video that explains um, that keeping early discovered wounds covered and moist is really effective and can lead to the avoidance of severe wounds altogether. Um, so clean, covered and moist. Um, Jason said that sort of anything that keeps a wound moist is good, whether that be triple antibiotic cream or Vaseline, um, and then keeping it covered. Um, we also want to encourage good hygiene. Um, this is, you know, the use of new sterile materials for drug use and an abundance of hand washing to make sure that these wounds do not become infected. We also want to advise that people who use drugs never use alone or have someone checking in on them, um, that they have naloxone on hand to reverse an opioid overdose if necessary, um, to use in a safe space um, because heavy sedation may increase their risk of assault or injury, and also to lay down or sit before using to avoid falls and injury. Next slide, please. 
Um, and then this is a wound care resource that Boston Medical Center developed with the University of Pittsburgh. We will be sharing it after the webinar in our follow-up, um, Just, but I just wanted to get it in front of you so that you can seek it out in the email afterwards. And now I will pass it back to Tracy again. Thanks. Um, so what we're going to do is put uh, everything that we've been talking about together, talk through a case study. Next slide. Um, so here's the situation. Uh, imagine you're working and come across an unconscious person. The person wasn't breathing, so you administer a dose of naloxone. They're still unconscious, but are now taking a breath approximately once every six seconds. They have a slow pulse and you can see an abscess on their hand. Um, so to recap, they weren't breathing. You gave them naloxone. They're unconscious, but taking a breath every six seconds and they have a wound on their hand. So we're gonna put a pull up on the screen. Um, do you think it's A, probably an opioid overdose, B, probably an opioid overdose with xylazine and, or C, unsure, not enough info? Okay. Okay, so um, it looks like 88% of people got it right. So it's um, safe to assume that it's probably B because the breathing has been restored even though they're still unconscious. And also you notice the wound that they have. Um, so we're gonna do another poll um, and we're asking, uh, based on this info of the scenario we shared, uh, do you think that A, another dose of naloxone should be administered, or B, another dose of naloxone should not be administered? Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, so this one is more even split. Um, so 47% of people thought we should give another dose. Um, so the answer is B. Um, so naloxone should only be administered to restore breathing. And if breathing is restored, you should monitor the person, but you shouldn't give any more naloxone. Um, if the breathing is not less than once every six seconds. Um, and we recommend not giving more naloxone because it can put someone into precipitated withdrawal. So if you give someone too much um, naloxone and they come to in withdrawal, uh, they may probably want to uh, go and use again. And once the naloxone wears off um, in about an hour, uh, they would be at risk for overdose again. Next slide. So um, passing it off to Zoe, who's going to summarize takeaways. Great. Thank you, Tracy. So just a reminder, and I feel like um, we've really been saying it a lot today, but just a reminder, always administer naloxone. So uh, some of the other things you can do are you can alert organizations, community, and people who, who use drugs about the possible presence of xylazine, as we learned from the focus groups. Um, people aren't always aware of what they're using. So it's um, good to let them know that that might be in their drug supply and encourage folks to seek medical care and support for any wounds that start to appear. Um, the second thing is to provide harm reduction tips for people who use drugs. We have a couple tips on the screen, like uh, never use alone, um, have naloxone on hand, test for fentanyl, and then prepare community-based organizations for wound care. We are gonna have a follow-up um, webinar that where we're gonna talk about some of the uh, community and interventions that folks have um, done as part of the 10 communities that are part of this project. And we'll talk more about wound care at that time. Next slide. 
So thank you guys so much for coming today. And thank you to everyone who took the pre-webinar survey that was sent to you via email. We really appreciate it. Now that you have um, taken the webinar, we encourage you to take a post-webinar evaluation. It will take no more than 10 minutes. And once you've filled it out, um, that'll come in an email after this. And once you've filled it out, we'll send a, certi a certificate that looks something like the one on the screen um, for you to print after you've completed that. And then next slide. And we just wanted to close with a quote from someone who participated in the focus groups with Thomas Jefferson University. And the, the question was, how do you think police officers could help people who are using xylazine? And the answer was, just be a little bit more understanding or educated about it. Education is where it has to start. They can't help nobody if they don't understand it or have knowledge about it. We're willing to accept any help. So thank you all for taking the first step and getting educated about xylazine. We're gonna go to the next slide here. And there is our contact information as a follow-up. And we will now uh, take questions from the audience. So Isabella, if you wanna stop sharing your screen and we'll have all of our speakers on, everybody can come on video, great. I have been answering some questions that have come into the Q&A as we've gone along. Oh, fantastic. But other people should still ask questions. So um, one in there is about BTNX has test strips. So Becca, do you want to just address the research you've done on the xylazine test strips? Um, sure. So I think a lot of folks are doing research, but uh, at Brandeis, we... Um, are doing a validation study or trying to see if there's false positives or false negatives associated with the BTNX test strips. Um, there is seems to be known cross reactivity with lidocaine, which is can be a common cut in the stimulant supply. Um, so among cocaine and crack. Um, so at this time, they're definitely not recommended, in my opinion, um, for testing of stimulants. But um, I know that a lot of folks. I think I was scrolling through some of the pre-test responses and a lot of folks are distributing the xylazine test strips. So we do think it can be a useful community engagement um, tool, but we're not totally sure about how accurate they are in terms of always detecting xylazine or not. Um, but you can buy them from BTNX. You might be able to buy them with your state or federal funding, um, but you'd need to ask specifically uh, about that. All right, there are a couple questions in the chat uh, or in the Q&A about getting copies of the slides and we will send those afterwards in the email. Um, and then can someone answer the risk differences between using xylazine between IV oral and nasal ingestion? I know that that's not my area of expertise. You know, we're still not sure um, what the wounds are associated with. If there's, we, we know that they're not limited to people who inject. We know that they're not um, always at the site of injection. They can be at other sites. So um, we know that if people do inject and they're willing to inject differently away from the areas of wounds, that that's better. Um, we know that the, the our respondents our focus group respondents who were primarily snorting the substance still reported side effects, including some wounds. So we don't have enough research to answer that question definitively. And uh, Cindy asks, are there urine screen tests which will detect xylazine? Uh, no, there are not urine screen tests that will detect xylazine. In a medical setting like a hospital, um, people have to send out um, a supply that send out um, a, a blood sample to detect um, what's in whether xylazine was exposure has occurred or not. The test strips will use um, will will go directly into the substance with a little bit of water, um, but it, it, as Becca pointed out, um, we're not sure about the effectiveness of those test strips yet. So Francis asks, in talking to a lot of medical examiners, it seems like xylazine is never the reason for death rather than a contributing factor or presence. Has there been any proof that xylazine has ever been the primary reason for death in your research? There's been some literature where historically 
we should say xylazine has been present in Puerto Rico for over 20 years, and it's been in Philadelphia for since 2006. So um, there is some experience historically with it. In the literature, when I looked at it, historically, it, it sometimes was used by veterinarians as a means of to complete suicide. So because of, of its heavy sedation, it, it can someone could complete suicide if they had a very heavy dose. But I would agree that from the data we currently have and from medical examiner data, um, it's typically in combination with other drugs, um, not found alone as a source of, of mortality. Yeah, I would say that in the drug supply monitoring that we've been doing, we have not seen just xylazine um, as a component. Typically, it is found with fentanyl, heroin, or other opioids. They are found um, in combination with each other. And just what I have heard from folks, from medical examiners, from police officers, et cetera, is that um, at the state lab and other labs, they are not identifying xylazine as the cause of death. It typically is um, fentanyl or another active substance. Another way to think about it is what's the long-term effect of chronic exposure to xylazine? I think we don't really know that as well. But um, one presentation I heard talked about hypoglycemia. So people who are already compromised may experience other problems because of the, um, the effects of xylazine. Um, Carl asks, asks, is there any research being done on isotonitazine? Which I'm sorry, Carl, that is a, beyond my ability yeah. to answer that. <laughs> I don't know what that substance is. If it's a, um, if it's something that might be used as a reversal agent, I'd say um, no. I don't know that that's currently occurring. Um, yeah. So I think there is some re research or something being done on nitazines, uh, isotonitazine or nitazines in general. But um, many of us, or the drug checking project that I'm working on, is yeah, a nitazine. So it's like a more potent opioid. But um, we haven't seen them. I know that folks are seeing them in Canada and Chicago, um, but we I cannot answer um, about that research at this point. Okay. Yeah, and Carl clarified that it's a, another type of opioid. So it would be not a, not a treatment or reversal agent, but another threat. And that's one of the issues for, for users on the street is that they really don't know what they're using, no matter how it's packaged. Um, some of the contaminants in the substance um, may be harmful, even not the act, even things that are not active, um, psychostimulants or psychodepressants. Um, Bradley asks, do you foresee xylazine use disorder becoming a DSM diagnosis? Could you repeat that? Yeah, do you do you foresee xylazine use disorder becoming a DSM diagnosis? That's a that's a very good question. Um, some people are beginning to feel like there is a um, a, a withdrawal syndrome associated with xylazine. Um, so I suspect in the future there will be more data to determine that. At this point, there there isn't enough data. I see there's also um, questions about wounds. Um, do the wounds typically show up on similar parts of the body? Um, and also um, I'm mentioning antibiotics being administered. So is it a bacterial infection? I'll take the first one first, that these necrotic wounds um, can occur without bacterial infection. One of the, so in other words, these very, very severe wounds um, can occur independent of any source of infection. One of the issues is once you have that open wound, infection is a complication that can occur rapidly. So we're trying to avoid having that occur. So you can use antibiotics, but it's not actually required. Soap and water is what is required as a first line defense with covering to make sure um, it doesn't get an infection and that um, it, it will heal. Do they typically show up on particular parts of the body? Um, we do have one handout we can send out where they tend to be on the, the front of the legs, the front of the limbs, um, sometimes even on the hands. But again, it's not necessarily associated with, with where the injection occurs. 
All right. Um, I think this one's for Tracy. If someone knows xylazine is in what they're about to use, do we know if they're less likely to use it? Wondering about the harm reduction aspect and the outreach, outreach we do. Um, so the people that we've talked to in Philadelphia, it's a little bit different because the dope supply has been saturated for a long time. So a lot of people that use dope are like have accepted that they're currently um, addicted to xylazine and that they actively look for xylazine when they're buying drugs. Otherwise, they feel like it's not effective. Um, so they will still use it. And that's why I mentioned before, they thought the xylazine test strips may not be helpful for them anymore, but that it could be helpful in other mar in other places where it's emerging and it's something that you can avoid using. I think that's a big part of the public um, awareness campaigns. We've been working with local communities and we want to alert harm reductionists so they can alert people that they serve, people who use drugs, that if you can avoid xylazine in the first place, you're gonna be much better off. Um, and in some drug supplies that's still feasible, in most drug supplies that's still feasible. Cindy asks, uh, in our community, it was identified in a pill form for a vape pen. Is this common across the nation? And Becca, do you have more information about the way the form you've seen xylazine in drug checking? Yeah, I can really only speak to New England or really mostly Massachusetts, a little bit of Vermont and Connecticut. And we have mostly seen it in powder forms um, or in residues of folks who have injected like in cottons and cookers, etc. cetera. Um, I think I wouldn't be shocked if I saw it in a pill, but I haven't noticed that. And um, I haven't heard anything about any illicit substances in vape pens that were not intentionally added, but that doesn't mean that it hasn't occurred. So not sure. Thank you. And then uh, we're gonna take this final question from uh, Natasha. What is the percentage of adolescents consuming this? And I think that that's unknown unless um, one of you has an answer. Yeah, I think we just don't know enough. Um, and And like Becca said, most communities don't know enough about what is in their drug supply to really have a good answer for that. Um, and Mary Jo, I see you're answering Francis's um, question as well. Yeah, so there was a question about, is the necrotic skin the result of the environment that the drug users are in, such, a way, such as not having a way to bathe? Um, is it 100% proven that these necrotic instances are from xylazine? Do animals see the same reaction? Um, I heard a speaker uh, yesterday say that animals do sometimes uh, show up with wounds as a result of the xylazine administration. Um, yes, I think it's complicated. Why do they develop to become so severe? I think it is because of lack of treatment. Um, so, but, but in other words, not being able to keep it wound, not being able to keep it covered or, or wet, um, or not having early treatment. Um, is it because of the un, because of the dirty conditions? I'm, I'm sure that's a, a contributing factor. We really don't know. One of the, um, Specialists thought it had to do with, let's say, picking at the wounds, um, because it tends to be the severe wounds tend to be on the front of the body, not on the back of the body. So they they thought it might be related to, you know, picking of the wounds. But we think it can be, the, the, these deep necrotic wounds can be avoided with um, early wound care. 